Dr. Raza. He's a professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, his medical degree was uh, obtained at King Edward Medical University in Lahore, pa Pakistan. His doctorate in pharmacology from Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Uh, he is a professor at the Department of Psychiatry at UT Southwestern Medical Center, specializing in refractory depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, neural stimulation, and psychopharmacology. Whew, I got that out. What do you know? What do you know? <laughs> Dr. Dr. Raza has uh, served on the, as a medical director uh, of the inpatient unit at the Zale Lipsy Pavilion, William P. Clements Jr. University Hospital for more than a decade. He's been involved in teaching and training medical students, residents, and psychiatrists for over 25 years. Dr. Raza, thank you so much for being here. And if you have any comments you'd like to share with us uh, as an opening, now would be a good time, sir. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gary, for the for the uh, introduction. Uh, you know, it's been what, about four months, coming up to four months, that we've been uh, struggling with this issue, uh, and and understandably, it is a very very difficult issue, and some of which Tom had pointed out uh, to the messaging uncertainty, uncertainty uh, about what actions we need to take. But I think if we step back a little bit and, and try to understand what happened, uh, I think the two or three things are clear. One is the, that this is clearly, truly unprecedented. I mean, never before, I think, in, frankly, in the, in, the, in the recent modern history that we see an affliction or, or a situation that has pretty much affected the whole world and in a very, very short period of time. Uh, because of globalization, because of uh, you know how we are able to travel and communicate and so forth, this thing has evolved at a pace which is difficult for human mind to really process and and truly internalize. So one is the speed at which our entire life, to be honest, was upended. Whether it be our professional life, be it our personal life, our recreational life our social life, you name it. So I, I think that that part, I think we all have to accept and agree that this is something that we, we don't have a playbook. We, we don't have something to go back on. Yes, there have been pandemics in the past and there have been studies on them, but, but you know, much of what happened in the past, some applies to the situation and some does not. So couple that with the uncertainty of a novel disease that we don't know much about, we don't have much knowledge how it spreads, how to control it, uh, and we are consistently learning more and evolving our responses. So that uncertainty coupled with the some indecisiveness and dithering and some sort of conflicts uh, or differences of opinion, what is the best way forward, has really created a very, very difficult situation and over and beyond uh, just what the factual uh, situation would demand. So, so that part I think we have to accept. And as discussion goes on, we can get into the nitty gritty of uh, what happened and how do we moving forward maybe rectify some of that situation. But, but generally speaking, when you go through an, a pandemic like this, you're gonna go through a period of uh, detection when you know cases begin to come to light then you will go through a period of acceleration then there'll be a flattening of the curve then there's a period of deceleration and then eventually you wipe out the disease either by herd immunity or by vaccination so part of the challenge, you know, we are a massive country and, and, and some people would say that we are multiple countries, you know, sort of living in a union. Uh, so just because of our geographical vastness, uh, the problem is that the peaks and those deceleration phases are occurring at different times in different places. So that creates a little bit of a, a difficulty in being able to come up with a more coherent response. But the, the way we recover from, from difficult situations or crisis is that we go through the early phase of dealing with it, which is what we are doing, doing right now, trying to understand, trying to control it. Uh, then we will get into what I would say would be a recovery phase, 
uh, where you begin to start recovering from the damage that this thing has done and the fallout and so forth. After recovery, we are going to have a stage of what I would term as normalcy, where we try to approach you know, the, 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 the baseline that we used to have, uh, followed by restoration. Restoration, whether we uh, come out doing better out of this crisis or doing worse coming out of this crisis. So really, I, I think if you break down the outcomes, we don't know which way this thing is going to play out, right? I mean, so far, results have been mixed at best. We don't know where this thing is going to eventually end up. So there are really four different options. And I think as small business people, you may want to prepare for all of those outcomes because we really don't know what that outcome is going to be. The first one is that we deal with this situation fantastically and we control the situation quickly and come out stronger at the end of the crisis, which is what true resilience would demand, right? That you go through a stressful period and you not only deal with it with an adaptive way of coping, but you come out of it doing better than what you went in with. The second option is that we, some or the other, we deal with the situation and we simply restore our previous level of functioning and just go back to the way we were. The third option is that we somehow the other somewhat control the situation, but lose something in the process as a society, as individuals, uh, as a community. And the fourth outcome, which is the worst outcome, is that we deal poorly with the current situation and come out of it as a weaker community, as weaker individuals. So it's very, very difficult to know at this stage, uh, to be honest, how this will eventually play out because we're still uh, in the process of dealing with it. So the question is whether we're going to have post-traumatic stress out of it or we're going to have post-traumatic growth out of this process. And, and to some degree, I think things can be done to ensure one outcome or the other, and those have to be done collectively. So I remember, you know, it was probably in the middle of March when this thing had just started. Um, and I was invited to do uh, an interview on NPR uh, on a program by the name of Think. Uh, this was, I remember, on the 18th of March when things had just started. And even at that time, my, my main contention was that this thing has to be dealt with collectively. Never before, you know, really since World War II, have we, as a nation, faced a crisis or a situation where a collective action is way, way more important than individual interests. So take the example of younger people. Now, while they will not be you know, seriously affected by the infection in most cases, but they could become a conduit for spreading that infection. So I've been saying right from the beginning, and I think this holds true even now, the main concern for most of us, except the vulnerable group, is to protect others. We ourselves, the chances that we will be afflicted by it and have a very serious outcome, yes. In some cases, that has to be the case, so the usual vulnerable groups. But for most people, it is a responsibility, a societal, civic, collective responsibility not to spread the disease. And doing so, while it is very simple and very straightforward, it is very mundane, very routine, very unheroic, and very difficult to do consistently day in and day out, unless we call that true spirit of altruism into play and true spirit of nationalism and patriotism. Uh, uh, so I think that one of the things that has been somewhat disappointing, and Tom alluded to that, has been the uncertainty of the message. And part of it is the nature of the disease and pa pandemic. I mean, we knew very little about it. Part of it is as it evolves, our responses are going to evolve. So that creates some uncertainty. 
Part of it is not having a clear message that people hear and act on. And, 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 and in some ways, you know, turning a very simple, in some ways straightforward medical issue into more of an, you know, a more difficult emotional and ideological issue is something that I think it doesn't serve us well. Uh, so I think uh, with that uh, brief introduction and I, you know, there are data we're beginning to see on the emotional impact of it. There's a number of uh, things we can uh, discuss or speculate about. There are a number of things we have data on. And as, as the discussion progresses, hopefully we'll get to focus on individual areas. But that would be my sort of general opening statement. And uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Dr. Raza. I appreciate this. I time. would like to defer to Dr. Raza. <laughs> yes, that was really, really good. <laughs> uh, well, with that, uh, I'd like to also uh, introduce our next panelist, uh, Tom Collins, CEO of Medical City Green Oaks Hospital. Since 1983, Mr. Collins directs the 124-bed Medical City Green Oaks Hospital and facilities that include offices or clinics in Las Colinas and in Plano and uh, an integrated care clinic at Medical Center of Dallas. Uh, Mr. Collins established the first and, and one-of-a-kind 24-7 psychiatric emergency room, which served as the front door for the seven-county North Stars program. Uh, the, uh, he's also instrumental in creating the Behavioral Health Leadership Task Force for Dallas County, which brings providers together to collaborate on various mental health issues, making improvements, in uh, the provider system, as well as communicating with legislators. Um, Mr. Collins, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Um, I appreciate being here. Uh, that was really a, a, a very good introduction, Dr. Raza. Um, you touched on all of the, the issues I think we have globally, but you know, I, I would talk more specifically. We, we have had uh, a service at Green Oaks uh, for almost 20 years and it's called work returns. Um, and it's for people who have gone out of work for usually a physical injury. The physical injury has been resolved and then they have to go back to work and they don't want to. They have all sorts of uh, anxieties and, and, and really on them. It's sort of their issues and you know they, they come and get counseling and we collaborate with the employer and, you know, wean them sort of off workers' comp and back to, to uh, being fully employed. It's one of the few behavioral services that, that is sort of concrete in its outcome. You know, 75% of the people who come get back to work uh, within three weeks and they stay there. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's a, sort of a, almost a single issue kind of, uh, kind of a problem, but when, when the coronavirus hit and people were furloughed and then it was time to go back to work, the whole dynamic sort of changed for, for all the reasons Dr. Raza issued. It, was, it, it wasn't the, that the people had their own individual anxiety, it, it really had more to do with the mixed message, the, the sense that they were completely out of control, that they didn't know what to do, their employers didn't know what to do. Everything became sort of suspect uh, in terms of, you know, guidelines. You know, what, what's the motive for these guidelines? Um, and there really became sort of a confidence issue uh, between employers and people coming back to work, uh, either after being furloughed or uh, being laid off and starting with a new employer. So really the, the emphasis for getting people back to work became more, had more to do with the employers. Um, and really the communication has to do with creating, I mean, it's an opportunity, right? It's, uh, it's creating this culture with people where sort of the employer, the best thing we've seen, the best sort of reactions by employers are employers who say, um, we don't know, we're, we're not confident either in the sort of national guidelines or state guidelines, uh, but we are confident in our own. So we're gonna take the most careful approach. We're gonna create this sort of culture of safety. Um, we're gonna elicit your input into that. So 
You know, we're going to tell you all the things we're doing to keep our employees safe and to continue on with our mission, serving whoever uh, our, our clients or customers are, and in our case, patients. Um, uh, we're going to tell you all the things that we're doing in the culture to keep you safe and keep us safe. And then we'd like you to participate in that. We'd like you to tell us what makes you feel, what would make you feel more comfortable about coming back. And uh, we have really found that, that once you sort of accomplish that and you, you get people to take the step, um, you, you become a safe haven. It has, for, for many of the employers we talk to, uh, they say that, that, that their culture is better, that, that people are sort of more loyal, that, you know, they, they really feel like it's a safe haven, um, but, but they have to feel like they have some control, some input into, uh, you know, what we're doing. Um, and unfortunately, it really has to do with saying, uh, we're not going to participate in the inconsistent messaging, either nationally, state level, local level. Um, we're going to create our own and we're, we're going to have as the highest priority uh, sort of safety. Uh, your safety, our safety, our customer's safety. Um, and and I, that, that has worked the best. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, we, we really want this to be an interactive uh, event. So if everyone, if you have an opportunity, please submit any questions, any, any more questions, I should say, uh, to the chat. But I'd actually like to start uh, with just a You know, of course, based on what you, what you both said, especially Dr. Raza, with you know so many unprecedented to, to tell. But you know, how do individuals and, and communities react and behaviorally to an, to an event like like a pandemic, like just a pandemic in general? Like, what's what's been the experience there? Uh, <clears throat> so, Gary, uh, pandemics, in, in, in some ways, uh, is probably the best example of something tapping into how our fear or anxiety circuitry, brain circuitry is, is, is basically evolved or how it functions. So basically our, our you know, survival mechanisms uh, are, which is you know, a very basic in instinct and which we share by the way with you know, um, other uh, sort of species as well. I mean, it's this basically similar circuitry with some differences in humans, basically it is designed to protect you. So what it, it is designed to react to in a, in a very robust fashion is, is new situations. Because it's an old and familiar situation, you've been through it and you have some idea of how to handle it. So something which is novel and new and something which is uncertain. So there, there's no element of you know, predictability about it. So you combine that with the fact that this virus is, is, is an invisible enemy. I mean, that really makes a big difference. If you know for sure, uh, you know, who you're sort of, who to protect from, and you can visibly see it, you can touch it, you can, uh, you have a sort of a concrete image of it, it makes it easier to do that. than an invisible risk that could be lurking at any step. You could be going out doing your routine stuff and it may afflict you. It may be one of your loved ones who may bring it to you without knowing about it. So that invisibility and that gives it another mystifying sort of layer to it. We react to situations uh, if the outcome, even if it is less likely, but the outcome is, is extremely serious, we're gonna to react to that situation to a greater degree than we would to situations where the outcome, even though more people may be affected, but the outcome is not that serious. So the flu versus uh, the, the COVID uh, sort of comparison, so to speak. So the, the, it, is, it is known that in every pandemic, generally the response of the communities and individuals is one of fear and panic to begin with. 
right? So we saw all the toilet paper buying and all the run on the grocery stores, which, is, which happens, which happens in most pandemics. I think in our case, the initial response of that fear that we had is now replaced by a response of grief and loss. So we've lost a tremendous number of things without really necessarily sitting down and thinking about it. We've lost our autonomy. We've lost our, uh, in many cases, the predictability of our livelihood or our livelihoods. We've lost the autonomy to associate, the autonomy to, to do things as we please, to entertain ourselves, to engage socially and so forth. And so we, many times we think of grief as, you know, death of a loved one or, or, you know, something to that effect, you know, any loss will induce grief. And the stages of grief and the quality of grief can be a little bit different, but fundamentally follows the same principles. So I think we are, it almost seems like to me as a society are going through a period of grief and we really don't know what to do with it. And as you would expect, there would be many, many different reactions to grief, uh, depending on the individual. But there are some things which are, which are generally known as stages of grief or, or coming to terms with your loss, basically. And, and the first one is, is the tendency to deny that the problem really is as severe or the problem even exists. Denial is frequently followed by anger. And anger is, you know, why me, why us, you know, why this you know, virus from China, for instance, and some anger at others who may not be responsible for it. But, but, but anger can get directed in many, many different directions. And many times people expressing the anger may not know what they're angry about, but, but there's certainly any grief or loss would most people go through that phase. Then there's a phase of bargaining where you try to go back and forth and you give and take a little bit to, to feel a little bit good about the situation followed by a phase of depression, and then finally a phase of acceptance. So I think it is very important to view our reactions initially were, were driven by fear to some degree and anxiety about the uncertainty and so forth. And right now we are grieving and we are grieving in different ways. Effects, emotional effects that we probably are going to see in the long term. Um, obviously those effects, we haven't had enough time to be able to comment on that. Uh, there's some data that is beginning to come out, which is mixed by the way, whether how much is it truly impacting people or not. Uh, but, but I think we are also somewhat shielded by it uh, for the time being at least because of the support that we have uh, from various funding sources. So we haven't really started seeing the financial impact of this thing, uh, the way we are likely to see in months to come. So, so I think those are the emotional reactions that people would generally show to a pandemic. Uh, and and uh, there's evidence that uh, we are showing a mixture of those. Oh, that's, uh, wow, thank you so much. I, I, well, actually there's a question that's here. Uh, now I'll go ahead and ask it. Uh, and this could be, uh, I guess, you know, maybe to Tom. Um, <laughs> Uh, you might want to defer, but we'll see. Uh, are there uh, are there some individuals you think that are more it says more vulnerable than others? I, I'm thinking on an emotional level based on what Dr. Roz was saying. Yeah, there are, and it's sort of interesting. I'm not even sure how to interpret this. I'm sure it, it has to do with sort of the politic politic politicization of um, a healthcare issue. But generally, we have sort of two kinds of, of people that we see. Um, and those are those that are, they're, they're both traumatized, but it's sort of their reaction to the, to the issue. And one is that they're scared and they feel like they have no control and they need to collaborate with their employer and they want to feel safe. And they're following all the guidelines, wearing masks, social distancing. Um, and they're quite frankly, more easy, easier to deal with. and We can get them back to work more effectively. They're more collaborative. But then we have this other group of people who are, their reaction to this is anger. Um, and they don't want to follow the guidelines. They think their employer has overreacted. They think the community is overreacting. Um, and we have to spend a lot of time talking to them about 
what Dr. Raza was talking about earlier, that we're all in this together. We have to protect each other's health, uh, that they have a certain responsibility and really spend more time um, sort of trying to get them to understand their employer's perspective, that they have to deal globally with the employee group and, and the whole customer group, the community. But, but it is interesting to me that that, that, that there are those two, you know, both, both traumatic, both same sort of feeling about uh, all the dynamics Dr. Raza was speaking about, uh, but one group defiantly sort of angry about having to participate, uh, and that's the issue, and then the other that is much more willing to, you know, want to have a collaboration for guidelines and safety and masks and distancing and temperatures, you know, um, but, but it is interesting. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the next question would be, uh, and again, this, the, we're, we're gonna kind of call in some history and this is where both your experiences might come into play. Um, you know, what have we really, what have we learned so far about the impact of the current pandemic on mental health? I mean, I know that you both probably have different experiences than that, but if you could, uh, one of you could start, just share what you've, uh, your experiences in that. Please, Dr. Um, I, I think I'd just add to, uh, if you look at the vulnerable populations based on at least the data that we have, uh, there are certain uh, uh, subgroups, and this may be important for you to know as your employees come back into work as to uh, individual vulnerability, as we know, or individual resilience for that matter is very variable and, and uh, from person to person. So the people that have been identified in the previous pandemics and the studies that have been done on them uh, have identified particularly women and children as being particularly susceptible. Um, in addition to people with, as we can well imagine, people with pre-existing mental health issues, uh, people who have been quarantined, now we keep forgetting that we lose track of the statistics. We all, almost, you know, if you're going on the current numbers, we have had anywhere from 350 to 400,000 hospitalizations. The, the experience that those people have gone through, particularly those who've been in the ICU, particularly those who've been intubated in complete isolation away from human contact, so we are already accumulating a large number of those people. So in the past pandemics, it was usually people, we were more worried about people who were quarantined and, and what the emotional impact on them would be. So that obviously quarantine group is a more vulnerable group, but I think we have to pay particular attention to those who've been hospitalized uh, and those particularly who had very intensive treatments. And then obviously the frontline workers, the healthcare workers, the, uh, the people who've uh, dealt uh, with, with these things firsthand. So these are going to be very vulnerable groups who over time will be, and again, remember that PTSD doesn't develop immediately. There can be a delayed effect. So, so PTSD sometimes would develop or come to light you know, months after, or sometimes even I've seen years after somebody has had that experience. So that I think keeping an eye on those vulnerable groups uh, is, is going to be a very critical factor. Um, so the original question, Gary, what was it? I, I obviously it, it just, uh, what have we learned so far about the impact uh, about of the start, yeah. pandemic on on mental health? So the data so far, honestly, is mixed. I would say so. You know, but when we started, everybody's prediction was that we'll have a tsunami of mental health issues. And that may still turn out to be true. I'm simply going by what we know so far. So if you look at, there's a number of different data that have come out. So some of the initial data came out from uh, countries where we had initial pandemics, so China, Italy, and, and places of that kind, uh, where most of the data was for frontline healthcare workers. And you know that was in the early phase, uh, you know, with the lack of equipment, not knowing about the disease, not knowing what the risks are. So obviously, you know, we can, we have to take those into account. Anywhere from 35 to 70% of the healthcare workers in Wuhan, 
who initially took care of those patients had psychiatric problems, wow. uh, including you know depression, including insomnia, anxiety, distress, and so forth. Kaiser Family Foundation has been doing a, a, a polling, a survey of uh, general population. Uh, and they've been following the same people over time. And what they've seen is that about at least half of the people are reporting significant worsening of their mental health since the onset of COVID. And that worsening has occurred even though their fear of infection affecting them personally has gone down. So obviously there are factors other than just the fear of getting the infection uh, that are contributing to their, their emotional difficulties. So initially we saw a run on prescriptions. So in the first month or so, you know, there was anywhere from five to 10% in 15% even increase in your antidepressants, your anxiety pills, your uh, sleeping pills and so forth. That seemed to have normalized. So that is sort of back to the pre-COVID levels. Now, there are different ways to interpret that. It's hard to know that whether people were stocking up medications in the early part of the pandemic just to have those available, uh, or whether we are seeing a drop off in prescriptions because people are not pursuing uh, mental health care now, so they're not getting the prescriptions that they need. So, so you know, it could be a combination of those two factors. Uh, but so far, I think we've been shielded somewhat. You know, I think we have to give credit to our uh, officials and our uh, politicians uh, for something at least that they, they stepped in to, to at least prevent a caving of the social structure and the financial structure. So we really haven't had the job losses or the financial stress or the other issues that in the long term are clearly shown to have a negative impact. On, on mental health. So I'd have to say that the, in my experience, the patients I've been seeing have had a mixed experience. Mm -hmm. Some people who are, again, it depends on how much you're affected by it. So people who've been able to work from home, still have a job, have a job security, some of them are actually doing fine after the initial adjustment. You know, they're mind the break from the social life and the hectic rat race and the commute that they used to do. Uh, but then there's a subset of people uh, who obviously are having a difficult time just adjusting to the new routine, to the new lifestyle, to the loss of different things. So I think the, the, the data on mental health so far is somewhat mixed. I know there will be vulnerable group, groups who probably would be affected more, but I think we haven't seen the last of it yet. General predictions are that the rate of mental illness, the rate of alcoholism, uh, suicides, uh, all of those will likely go up in time. Uh, how much and, and to what degree I think remains to be seen. Well, indeed, I, I appreciate the, the positiveness in there. It's like, hey, some of them really embracing the, the change and hey, this is awesome. I can work from home as opposed to having to, that long commute because everything in Dallas is a long commute. Uh, with that, I'll uh, actually go, go to the next question here. Um, it says, uh, what are the expectations of workers from their organizer or their organizations and leadership regarding workplace and their, their other needs? So their, I guess workplace and, and personal needs. I defer to you, Tom. This is your area of expertise. Sure. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's an expectation, but there is an opportunity. And I think what people need is uh, the, the sort of security, again, to, to believe that their employer is creating a, a safe environment, that, that they're asking for collaboration. Um, and, and I think that is the best opportunity for employers to sort of reconnect with employees, create uh, even better culture than they had previously. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's the, the most effective strategy for getting people back to work. I'd just like to add to that. I agree, fully agree with uh, Tom, that the primary concern of the employees is their safety and secondly, their own interest. So if you look at, uh, you know, I, maybe in our last discussion, I uh, drew attention to the participants at that time to a Gallup uh, survey. Gallup has been... Uh, 
and I'll briefly mention it again because it's very relevant to what uh, the expectations are. So, you know, I think it, we can, we have to come up with a plan, right? So your usual safety plan, your building modification, your workflow modification, you know, all of those OSHA guidelines and, you know, whatever you need to do is the practical, pragmatic aspect of it. Um, but I think for an employee, the most critical thing is, are there, are their interests being looked at? And Gallup has been doing this survey with every major crisis that we've had since the Great Depression. So this goes all the way back to Great Depression, Pearl Harbor, uh, the Korean War, the, uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the 9-11, you name it, every, every single crisis that we've had. They've asked workers over that, uh, the years as to what their expectations are from their leaders and from, from their bosses. And, and the thing, it's been fairly consistent regardless of which crisis that there are basically four qualities that they're looking for. And this is a study published by Gallup. You can go on their website and you can look at it uh, yourself. So they're basically looking at their leaders to do one of the two things. One, to, to find a way forward, not to look helpless. So to come up with solutions and to make it clear to the employees how they can be part of the solution and what they can contribute to it. So that's sort of their, their broad principle. But the qualities that they've consistently looked for in leaders are the four qualities, basically. Compassion, hope, stability, and trust. So those are the four, and in, you know, over the years, no matter what crisis you look at, those are the qualities that employees want to see uh, in their leadership. So, so I think if you look at that framework, it gives you some idea as to what the general approach should be other than the practical issues that you have to deal with. You know, it was, as far as an opinion then, I mean, maybe as an executive or somebody who's with a, with a small business, what are, uh, I guess, what might a business leader do to collaborate and, um, and maybe create a more settled work environment. Like, you know, because I mean, it could, this could be like a five-fold question, but I figure I can kind of throw it out and, and maybe we can get some, because as far as that goes, I'm also thinking, you know, there might be, you know, what might be warning signs or, or signs of anxiety or what do you think are maybe some coping mechanisms that are used that can kind of be a flag to someone who, you know, who cares, but maybe not have the right insights to, to find out what's, what's going on. I hope I made that lucid. <laughs> Tom, do, 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 would you like to comment on that? And I, yeah, like I, to... I, I think if I, if I can sort of bear down on one part of the question, for, for people that are coming back to work in one of the hospitals, we have you know, 14 hospitals, um, again, what they're, what they're really looking for is uh, reassurance that their safety is as important to you as it is to them. So I've had phone calls with employees who are concerned about their family members. Um, and, it, you know, if they come back to work, what happens if they catch it or, um, you know, are, are somehow uh, vulnerable to, to bringing it back to their family members. And Really, it's it's about reassuring them and making them understand that their, again, their safety is as important to you as it is to them, um, and talk about all the things that you're doing. That, you know, we have one entrance, one exit, no visiting. Um, people get their temperature taken. Everyone's wearing masks. We work towards social distancing. You know, all the usual things. Uh, but but I think the main thing is that that you ask for their input and get them to understand that you want them to be part of the team, uh, that, that we're all in this together, that, that uh, we're all concerned about it. And, um, you know, you're going to be watching for, for their safety. You, you want their input. You're concerned about their family. Um, and, and I guess the main thing is that, that it's a safe haven, that, that whatever, gets politicized and how, however the guidelines change in the community, um, that they're not going to, uh, for them, for, for, for their employer, that, that we're focused on safety, we're creating a safe culture, we're concerned about you, 
just that sort of collaboration and those sort of rock hard safety standards and values. I think reassuring people is, is really the main thing. So uh, in that context, I think uh, the only thing I'll probably add to is, I mean, obviously you're going to do your usual uh, preparatory things, right? Your, your, the physical plant as to how you're going to prepare it and the, how you're going to, uh, you know, sort of the control the access, as uh, Tom pointed out, in terms of who comes and who goes, and how you uh, keep some tabs on that, and how to maintain, you know, social distancing, and you have to take into account the density and 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 those with <clears throat> increase uh, sort of attention to the hygiene, to decreasing touch points as much as you can. Uh, and as Tom mentioned, the, you know, the importance of communication and ongoing communication that they know exactly uh, what is going on as things are evolving, as things are changing. Um, I think the, the most critical thing for employees is to be well informed and to know that their interests are being looked after. So in the same Gallup uh, survey, I, I think one of the things that previous studies and surveys have shown is that the employees, particularly in situations like this, when they are coming back uh, to work, since the work environment and the operating procedures and other things may have changed sufficiently, you really should engage in a complete reorientation with them as to what the expectations are, what they how they can contribute to it, and how you deal with this situation. And the reorientation is best done, even in that Gallup survey, by the immediate supervisor, not by the, the CEO of the company. Because the immediate supervisor knows the person, knows their issues, there's a certain connection which is already there. So what I would suggest to you is that, you know, if you're, you are the direct supervisor, be it, uh, but, but to have people who are immediately above them, to, to be the main person who provides all the guidance and the emotional support and so forth. So by doing this, you create what is known as a rallying effect, which is that the people, as opposed to looking helpless and you know, looking for directions to you, tend to become autonomous and more self-actualizing. So, so I just add those components to it. And, but I, I think Tom has emphasized that issue of safety first, I mean, that is the thing that they have to be 100% sure of that is not only being catered to now, but would be in the future. Oh, great. But, well, actually, you know, in that same vein, a uh, question just came in uh, from Carola Broadus. Uh, Carola, I'd ask you to just unmute and, and ask your question of the panel. Yeah, so my question is, and thank you again for participating and, and being a part of this. Um, are, are there indicators that an employer should look for in an employee where they should seek uh, that they are going through anxiety or have mental issues? Because I know people don't tend to accept or ask if they do have an issue. Yeah, I mean, we've had, we've had people come back who um, react to the environment, right? They get angry about wearing masks. They don't want to do social distancing and um, their attitude and disposition sort of changes and that th those are signs that those people need some intervention either with employee assistance or some sort of counseling i mean it is uh, in and of itself a, a difficult situation to, to enter into an environment where everything is different where you're required to wear masks and distance and uh, the cafeterias are different, um, meetings are different, people aren't getting together. And some people uh, just have a hard time adjusting to that. Um, and, and you can see it in uh, their sort of attitude and, and disposition. And employees will come and say, um, this person is not acting like their usual self. and uh, yeah, they, they need help at that point. So uh, uh, Tom is rightly pointing out that, that you know, the, the reaction to this situation 
it can be multiple, right? So there's the emotional reaction where you become more depressed or as Tom said, you could have the opposite. You become angry, irritable, have poor frustration tolerance. There are obviously all kinds of other symptom complexes and pictures, you know, it can affect your intellectual functioning. It can affect, uh, start causing physical symptoms. It can begin to impact your behavior, can lead to increased alcohol use, uh, can lead to substance use and so forth. So those things, those can be the manifestations. The key thing to remember there is that I think anxiety and, you know, is to be expected. All of us are feeling it to some degree or the other. It's not so much a question of feeling a certain symptom, uh, but a question of three things. One, how much, how long does it last? So for instance, you know, people can experience brief symptoms of trauma, but if they last only a few days and they go away and never come back, we really don't worry about those. It's really when they persist for three months or longer, then we start calling it PTSD. So the duration of those symptoms is important, uh, how long it lasts. Brief reactions can occur to, 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 to in many people and they're perfectly normal reactions. The second thing is how much distress it causes. So in your personal life, uh, to you as a person and how much dysfunction it causes, be it occupational, uh, be it social or family dysfunction. So I think it's not a question of uh, more so the presence or absence of certain symptoms, but how, how they're impacting you and to what degree. So once you begin to see that, I think the way I present it to people, and that has happened with many people, initially, most of the new people I was seeing were the healthcare workers, or some of our physicians and some of our uh, nursing staff. But I knew that they would require that for a short period of time. It was a crisis that they needed to get through. And they were going to come out perfectly fine and maybe even stronger at the other end. So I think the key thing for you while promoting wellness and, you know, the good life skills and coping strategies is for you to destigmatize help. Help in these situations at times is temporary. You don't have to get on medication. It's not you're going to get a mental health diagnosis that's going to stick with you for the rest of your life. Uh, but it's just an opportunity to deal with the crisis. So if you can identify those who are not only getting impacted to a greater degree, but also provide them with resources. Some help can be achieved now with very confidential, uh, with a great deal of confidentiality. You can do it by remote means. You don't even have to go in. So I think that uh, it is very critical to destigmatize it and encourage people uh, to seek help and, and knowing that the help it may, may be just transient and temporary. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, again, both of you, thank you very much for, for volunteering uh, uh, the day to, uh, to chat with us and share these insights. Um, I also uh, would like to thank the, uh, the wonderful uh, accounting firm Weaver for sponsoring the Small Business Toolbox here for the North Dallas Chamber of Commerce. Uh, right now, gentlemen, just so you understand, there would be this resounding applause, <laughs> which, which we, we, we're lacking in this situation since we told everybody to mute. So just imagine them clapping right now. 